the English are always the same. They invade our fishing limits and they reduce our numbers from 320,000 down to 270,000 <laughs> in an instant. Uh, I, I, what I've been engaged in over the past 20 years is to try to understand how diversity in the sequence of ACGs and Ts causes human diversity. And it's important to keep in mind that the diversity in the sequence of DNA is responsible for almost all of the diversity in the biosphere. There is no life without DNA. And once you come to that conclusion, it is, of course, important to define what is life, what constitutes the biosphere. And all kinds of luminaries have tried to define life. I think that this definition works for me. It's all self assembling systems that protect DNA molecules and allow them to replicate. And through the replicated DNA molecule, make another self assembling system of the same type. And once you buy into a definition like that, it's absolutely clear that the, that the DNA does not exist to, form, to make the life forms. The life form exists to protect DNA. So the goal of life is to preserve DNA on Earth, not particularly romantic view of life, but it's a, a fairly important one once you begin to look at how DNA mutates and the consequences of those mutations. And keep in mind that all of you, each one of you, is born on average with 70 new mutations, mutations that are not found in your parents. So the idea that was presented before, that the mutations somehow signify disease, is not correct. The mutations are extraordinarily important for the evolution of life, for the evolution of our species, for our, the ability of our species to adjust to new environment. But what we are focused in, uh, uh, at DECODE is on human diversity. How does uh, diversity in the sequence of the human genome cause human diversity, not just differences of diversity in, in the risk of disease, but all other diversity? And it is interesting, when you begin to look at that, how important the sequence you're born with is when it comes to your fate late in life. And I, in that context, I like to show the picture of these identical twins who at the age of 86 died from the same disease within an hour of each other. They're born with the same germline genome, and after 86 years of battling environmental influences, they die from the same disease at the same time. And you will probably argue that it is because they were so foolish. They both of them become Catholic monks, lived in the miserable conditions, I hate to say, miserable food. And you will say it's because of the environment. And, and I sort of agree with you, but at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you two arguments in support of the notion that there is a very significant genetic component to the environmental component of all human disease. Uh, what we have been doing and what people are doing who are trying to make discoveries of variants in the sequence that affect human diversity is that we work with two data sets, da data set on diversity in sequence and data set on diversity in phenotypes. And then we are looking for non-chance association between data points in the two data sets. And I think it's very important to recognize that still today, most of that search for non-chance associations has to be done more or less in a manual manner. You will not be able to unleash artificial intelligence algorithms looking for these associations, because otherwise you fall prey to too many testings. You always have to correct for multiple testing. And still today, we are struggling. I'm sure that IBM will solve that for us. Uh, but today, we have to do this mostly with human intelligence. And out of these, out of these uh, searches for variants in the genome that influence who we are, that dictate human diversity, we have basically two types of sequence variants. The common one that places on a normal distribution curve of physiological function. And if you are at one end of the, of the normal distribution, you, you are at risk of a disease. If you are at the other end, you are protected against the same. Each one of these common variants confer relatively little risk of disease. But you can have a confluence of common variants that confer a very, very large genetic risk of a disease, although they account for very little heritability because they are on many chromosomes. And then you have the rare variants that disrupt the same physiological function and, and cause the disease through an entirely different mechanism. And we at DECURT, we have discovered a very large number of common variants in the sequence that affect all kinds of phenotypes. We have also discovered a lot of rare variants that do the same. But what is most important and what I'm going to focus on 
in this remaining 10 minutes of my presentation is the brain. Because if I would take this lovely woman who, who introduced me before, I would peel the rest of her body away from her brain and keep her brain alive in a bucket. That brain would be her, all right? It could be argued that we really are nothing but our brains, and the rest of our body is there to move the brain from, one point, from point A to point B, and to allow the brain to take things in and get the things out. And what is interesting is that half of the genome, half of the genes in the genome, are only expressed in the brain. So for those of us who are interested in looking at variants in the sequence to shed light on human diversity, the brain is very important. And the brain is an organ of consciousness, all right? And consciousness has two components. It's alertness that we lose and regain at least once a day. And unfortunately, most people lose when I begin to lecture on genetics. And th then secondly, it's the content of consciousness, which are our thoughts and emotions, all right? And our thoughts and emotions define us as individuals, define us as a species, and define us as individuals of the species. And we haven't the faintest idea how the brain generates a thought. We haven't the faintest idea how the brain generates emotion. We cannot even define thoughts and emotions. We and others have been struggling, and, and one of the problems with looking at the genetics of diseases of the brain is that the disease is caused by disruption or perturbation of physiological function and when you don't understand the physiological function, when you cannot even define it, it is somewhat difficult to find variants in the genome that affect that particular phenomenon. It hasn't been particularly difficult with some diseases like Alzheimer's disease. We have, and others have discovered a lot of variants in the sequence that affect the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We, for example, discovered one that protects against it. And actually, yesterday or the day before yesterday, we discovered another one that confers a complete protection against Alzheimer's disease. But Alzheimer's disease is really a very, very distinct from the, or the process of, of Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis is very distinct from the normal function of the brain. But what is it, if you think about it, you know, what, what is it? You see, if, if you think about evolution, evolution takes place through random changes and then selection, selection of variants that make you have that as such, they confer on you attribute that allows you to have more children than those who don't have it. So how did, does that process lead to a brain that gives us the music of Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven? What does that have to do with the number of offspring? And, and the only explanation I have is that the brain is really the instrument that we use to cheat on evolution, all right? We can adjust to an environment without having to go through cycles of, of mutations and then selection. But how do we, how, what can we do to begin to explore the way in which the brain thinks? And one of the things we have done in the face of not being even able to, to define a thought is that we have taken variants in the sequence that affect the risk of diseases that affect thought and emotion. So we took copy, copy number variants that affect the risk of schizophrenia, which is a disease of thought and emotion. And we know that there are significant cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. These copy number variants that increase your risk of schizophrenia by a factor of 10. The population prevalence is 1%. So if you have these mutations, you have 10% probability of developing schizophrenia. 90% probability of not developing schizophrenia. And we ask the question, what impact, if any, do these copy number variants have on your cognition? And indeed, we showed that these variants affect cognition in the same way as schizophrenia, they, but not as severely in those who have the mutations and do not develop the disease. This is very important because it means that it isn't that you develop schizophrenia and therefore you think differently. It is that you think differently and therefore you're at risk of the disease. Extraordinarily important. At the time when we, at the time when we published this, it had been known that you're more likely to find individuals who are creative in families of schizophrenic than in the population in general. What was not known at that time is whether it's creativity and schizophrenia share biology, or whether the families of schizophrenics are just more tolerant to thinking differently. Because to be able to be creative, you have to think differently. And if you are in a family of schizophrenic, you're more likely to have mutations that make you think differently. All right? And, and to be able to think differently, you have to be able to think outside of the box. And if you leave the box in the morning, 
you may not be able to make it back into the box at night and then you're diagnosed with schizophrenia. Otherwise, you're just looked at on as a creative individual. So what we did is that we created a polygenic risk score for schizophrenia. The higher your risk score, the more likely you are of developing schizophrenia. So we took the members of the creative professions in Iceland, the Association of Iceland, the writers, the composers, all kinds of, of creative professions. And indeed, we showed that they have a polygenic risk score for schizophrenia that is substantially greater than in the population in general. So we had shown that indeed schizophrenia and creativity share biology. But creativity is a funny thing. And one of the elements of, of, of creativity is novelty seeking. So what we basically showed is that those who have high polygenic risk score for schizophrenia are more likely to have children with more than one mate. And this is what my mother would have called the undesirable component of creativity. But what then has been happening to the brain? Are we becoming brighter or are we becoming more stupid? How does evolution handle the ability of the brain to think? And actually, what we showed is that what everyone has known is that people with high education have more children than people with low education. And that basically, in the terminology of genetics, means that there is a negative selection against education. So we took all of the variants in the sequence that associate with, with high education or as, uh, with educational attainment, and we showed that their frequency is decreasing in our population. We also showed that there's a very tight correlation between educational attainment uh, and, and uh, verbal IQ. So basically, we have shown that there is a negative selection against intellect in our society in general. Uh, we are becoming more stupid by the generation. So thank God that IBM is developing machines for artificial intelligence, because ours is going out of the window. <laughs> uh, I promise to give you two pieces of evidence supporting my notion that there is a genetic component to the environmental component of the risk of common diseases, and, and uh, refer them to this uh, identical twins who died of the same disease at the same time, uh, at the age of 86. And the first is, has to do with a non-transmitted part of the genome. When a child is born, it receives half of the genome of the mother, half of the genome of the father, uh, but half of the genome of the parents are left behind. So what we did, and we are the only ones in the world who are in a position to do that now, is we simply looked at the variants in the genome of the parents that is not transmitted to the child, and we asked what impact, if any, does it have on the fate of the children? And indeed, it has enormous impact on the fate of the children. It has an impact on the risk of type 2 diabetes, obesity, addictive disorders, etc. And then you ask, what does the non-transmitted part of the genome do? It forms half of the, it is half of what makes the parents, and the parents are the most important part of the environment of the child in their early days. So there you have an example, and, and actually the transmitted part of the genome that goes into the child is not independent of the non-transmitted because of what we call a sort of mating, that people mate on the basis of shared attributes. That is one evidence in, the, in, the, in support of my contention that there is genetic component to the environmental component of all of these diseases. The second one came out of our work on the genetics of nicotine e dependence. In Iceland, e e we, we actually have found many variants in the genome that increase the probability that you will smoke. And if you smoke, it makes you smoke more, and it makes it more difficult for you to quit smoking. And then we took these variants, and we looked at them in the context of smoking-related diseases like lung cancer. And in Iceland, lung cancer is entirely environmental disease. 97.5% of those who develop lung cancer have smoked for decades. It's a pure environmental disease. But we showed that this variant, these variants that associate with, with nicotine dependence associate with dramatic increase in the risk of lung cancer. So the disease is environmental, but you inherit a compulsion to seek the environment that causes the disease. So there is really no distinction between nature and nurture. It makes no sense to try to separate them. We are simply the consequence of a series of DNA molecules that exist at some sort of an interface with the environment. Thank you.